friends, it's your old pal Joy the Lion. How are you all doing today? I hope you said great. We are going to have a great night because we are meeting up with my friend Keith Coogan, actor extraordinaire, <laughs> and his beautiful wife Pinky over at the Smokehouse. I have never been there. I've always wanted to go there. I know it's a legendary place that uh, they always talked about on the Larry Sanders show. So Gary Shandling hung out there. Bob Hope hung out there. Uh, Gary Marshall. George Clooney, a lot of people. So we're going to have dinner there and he's agreed to let me ask him some questions about the making of The Adventures in Babysitting. So Days with Jordan the Lion and you all, it begins right now. Hello. <laughs> hey Keith, this is uh, the great Keith Coogan for uh, everyone. Keith Coogan, I mean, really? I think so. We're talking, uh, don't tell mom the babysitter's this is dead. Keith Coogan, he's still alive? Keith Coogan? No, 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 no. This is, is he now? Is this he is, I don't know. There's a lot of questions. Is he okay? <laughs> Hi. Keith, uh, Keith Coogan, Coogan, Jackie yes, Coogan, yes, no, yes. Jackie uh, Coogan's grandson, and the star of what we're talking about today, which is Adventures in Babysitting cult classic and i want to talk to you because what um what kind of blew my mind was you guys had a reunion recently and how was that it was the, is this the first time you guys have met up or talked in a while or what, how often do you get together first time that five of us it was vincent d'onofrio elizabeth shu anthony rap meyer Bruton, and myself first time we all of us have been together in 35 years really since the movie came out um last time we saw each other was uh, in a limo with Chris Columbus going around theater to theater the opening week. So it was uh, it was funny. There's a great video on Pinky's um, Instagram. Go back to what, November? I can send it to you. Oh yeah, I'll insert it, yeah. Uh, it is fantastic. We go surprised. They had Aunt um, Elizabeth and uh, Vincent for sitting next to each other. And me and Anthony and Meyer were in another hall. Um, and uh, he snuck up beat. It was very really fun. And, and it took me back to being 17 years old. So, so take me back to being 17. How does this movie happen? How did you, did you audition? Did they come to you? Was this a big movie at the time? It was. I mean, as far as the production. One up, so I had gone up before. Uh, the Shining and Goonies and Gremlins and Stand By Me and Christmas Story and Toy Story and just did not E.T. Uh, it didn't get yet. Toy Soldiers? <laughs> toy, 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 the toy. The toy. The toy. Oh, oh, oh with Richard Pryor. Yeah, wow. And Jackie Gleason. Right. And, yeah. uh, and it got really close on E.T. The video games were right down downfall. Anyway, um, so the script comes and it's an uh, audition. Regular audition and, and it, you know, adventures in baby singing, really. And the script was not quite what it was when it came out, it had a different ending and whole deal. Did you audition for Chris? So, not at first, you auditioned, I think it was Jan, Jane Jenkins, Janet Hersenson, and then you go uh, up to like producer director, and they had hired. Um, they needed to make sure because Chris Columbus was the first time directing the Touch oh. Pictures, which had a solid run of eight or nine million dollar budgeted movies. Uh, it's the single most successful film investment fund in the history of movies. It's called Silver Screen Partners Three. It's based in Texas. George Bush Jr. sat on the board of this thing. You got a six hundred percent return on it. Wow! Because of moder mod moderately budgeted movies. Yet they did great box office like Stakeout and Outrageous Fortune and Splash. And, Was there a and, formula that they went with that yeah, you could see? Don't well, spend more than 10 million bucks when you make your movie. And all you need is one of those to make a hundred million dollars. And uh, was Elizabeth a sh was she a star at this point? I know she had done, you know, Karate Kid, but was she a bankable? Okay, who was? So it was. Um, uh, there's rumors online that it was a script that had come from Paramount to this. However, they had to do screen tests. So we got to after like one or two auditions, then you get up to screen test. And so in Burbank, they had a little warehouse building. Actually, it's the building they shot dinner and a movie for uh, TNT for years. Oh, okay, cool, um, cool. And uh, they had a, a real film camera, Panamazon camera. They were also kind of doing camera tests. They were going to be shooting pretty soon. 
and they screen tested uh, uh, closest to I think it was Jonathan Ward for Brad. At one point, me and Daryl, me and um, Anthony Rapp swap parts. They go switch. So I read for Daryl, and he read for Brad, and they're like, "All right, switch back." And the women were um, uh, Valerie Bertinelli and I think PB Cates. Yes. But both for. You know it was I know, I know it was for you. I was thinking. Um, <laughs> He's very, he was Lost very Boys. excited uh, about it. I was PB thinking um, Jamie Gertz, who uh, I think maybe. And who was it that said that they had. Oh, um, Claudia Wells. So, which is ironic because then Elizabeth Shu did Back to the Future 2. Yeah. But then Maya Bruton was also in Back to the Future. Anyway, there's a whole. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how that all so, works out. Um, we, they did screen tests, solid screen tests, and they would swap. They'd have four kids in a convertible in the alley behind this little warehouse. And we'd shoot the scene, and then they go, all right, grab the girl, grab the little sister, put it in a new little sister. And then, you know, to see the chemistry and everything. Yeah. Okay. So you, just, you didn't want to spend too much time not in the car yeah. filming. You just wanted to be a part of every mashup. And, um, did you have a grip on your character? I mean, did you? Because you're pretty much. We were talking about it. You come off very straight laced, the good guy, but in reality, you feel like you were the, the bad guy of the movie. Yeah, he's just a very uh, possessive, jealous, entitled, uh, spoiled brat. Uh, Bra spoil, um, spoiled brat. Uh, but uh, no, he's he's good. He's a good brother. Um, he's mean to his sister. But so I like the art that he doesn't get, you know, because Indy doesn't get to keep the art. It gets taken away from him for the last minute. So. Did you did you think um, when you were were auditioning, doing casting, and and getting movies, did you put together a whole backstory for your character when you went in? Um, no, I didn't you wouldn't do any of that stuff. Breakfast. That's I would just always because sometimes the you no come God, off so fresh face in it. Only Chris, that Chris Parker obsession with the babysitter, getting some, you know, obviously <laughs> Brad's a virgin. Um, and uh, the, it, the tone of the movie was this will be a uh, adventure rather than like a sleazy comedy or like a romantic yeah horror. yeah or a high school com high school love story kind of thing yeah, yeah, more similar structures to like ferris Bueller. yeah the playboy thing was always such an odd twist to this you know like that they find this playboy with her that looks like her in it you know and she's 17 in the movie you they know a macguffin something that would fit in a backpack yeah that's and true gremlin's backpack and chris columbus wrote gremlin so that's the easter egg too oh okay Okay. So they uh, Disney to make sure they had a hit. They hired. They said this is a babysitting movie. Let's hire a producer who had produced a babysitting movie before. So they hired the producer of the most successful movie starring a babysitter to that time. Deborah Hill who produced Halloween. <laughs> yeah. So her and Linda Oates had uh, a production company. They also did The Fisher King. Later, Linda Oaks, we've lost Deborah now, but Linda went on and did little movies like Interstellar. Fantastic. Wow. Couldn't have yeah. Better production too. One was like, let's take care of the artists, make sure they have what they want, and you know, I'll deal with that conflict. And the other one was, no, Tuesday, cancel that order. They just like. Good cop, bad cop. Right, good cop, bad cop, couldn't have been better. And uh, let's see, Deborah Hill's father is in the subway scene. It's the ticket taker going, who's going to pay for those kids? Oh, yeah, Somebody so... better pay for those kids. Oh, that's cool. Father. Um, so we got cast and it was, we're going to go do two, two weeks of rehearsal. Okay. So um, for those that aren't in the entertainment industry, it is rare that you get rehearsal. Usually you show up on set the first day and they're like, all right, let's do the love scene. Um, this was a real good chance to reverse, and they were kind of banging out the script a little bit, too. Do you think that was Chris's idea because he was new, or what was the rationale behind it? It seems like have, he would cost money you to... You have the job until your second paycheck clears. So, as you're rehearsing... In case they want to... Re it is to go, we haven't exposed any film. Oh, and they could replace you. The second week, and these scenes aren't working. The chemistry isn't what we thought, and you could... Like Back to the Future. Heck yeah. Oh, God, get Eric Stoltz. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So you guys do two weeks of rehearsals. Mm -hmm. do, 
Do you guys bond during that time? Do you? Oh, heck yeah. Um, uh, and we keep good friends with AFA. Rad, you know, Rad's my best friend. Yeah. Oh, is I'm it? I'm taking this very seriously. So to get the movie, I had done uh, lots of television uh, between 1976 and 1986, but I was one ready to transition into movie. I wanted to do movie. And they said I was too TV. So in the high school theater at Santa Monica High School, we had a theater press that had just come over from Beverly Hills High. Um, Beverly Hills High had a $200,000 theater budget based on the oil well that pumps up a lot. Uh, oh! 80 barrels a day, adds up. And uh, <laughs> Santa Monica High had a $600 theater budget. Gotcha. Public school. So, um, getting this teacher was really special, and every single person in the class that year went on to form theater companies. Right now, one of my classmates is the head of the Writers Guild. No kidding. Wow. Sitting on Writers Guild America West. And a very talented person. Absolutely. She invented those shows like Cold Case. And, uh, used to work on, uh, I think she got started doing story for Darren Starr, 90210. Moved up, started to do like NYPD Blues and stuff, and now she's uh, Writers Guild. Did she refer you to an agent? Did she, I mean... I mean, I'm just curious because you you were saying you you know you you thought that oh, they weren't yeah. so in high school seeing you that way. The professor had taught a technique for preparing a character, and it has to do with the backstory. It has to do with like you know they have a breakfast. It's not that, but there's it's a three barrel technique, and you have to jump over each barrel when you do your research and prepare. So I did this technique for the auditions. And I put the movie. Awesome. And uh, it's everything that's said about your character. Every, and uh, oh, everything, no, it's everything your character says and does. So if, you read for, if they do this and do that, you don't know when they're lying or telling the truth. You got, but then there's also everything that's said about the character. The second barrel is how are they seen in the world of the script. Exactly. That was. And the third one is research, is the time, the place. What do they do for, you know, a reason? How did they get here? All yeah. That, all of that, all that research. And then you're. Um, Good to go to play so, so that was um, uh, very stoked to get the movie, big movie, three months filming. Um, was it projected to be a hit when you guys were starting it? No today? movie is projected to be a hit. You go, well, it's a studio picture. It's not straight to video because at that time straight to video was a thing that started already. Okay. Um, you want. Uh, you don't want the rating to be too raunchy. Like I was close on Friday the 13th Part 4 final chapter. And my mom was, she'll never do a movie after that. You that movie. You're right. Yeah, you're probably right. And, uh, so she was I've worked for Disney at least six different projects over 47 years. TV shows, Disney Sunday movies, classic animated film. And, uh, Not a place you want to be blackballed from, anyway. Picture, a Disney picture and a Hollywood pictures picture. Hollywood pictures is for their R-rated movies. The Disney one was the Cheetah, rated G, and then Adventures of Babysitting, which was one of the early PG-13. And we had Chris Columbus, who had written Gremlins, which was one of the first. Uh, one year had Gremlins and Temple of Doom, and both were the first PG-13. What kind of direction did he give you guys while um, filming scenes? Did he keep it real and grounded and don't go over the top? The biggest direction was he'd go well, cut OTT. Um, over the top, I still rest just alone. It was in theaters and playing at the Cineplex Odeon in Toronto. <laughs> and it was an 18 play. So we built it and watched you know, all these great like, art films and new releases. And, and you're bored and you got time on your hands. So we all saw Over the Top and we went, oh, oh. Um, so that was a reference. He'd go, OTT, bring it back down. He's really good. He listened to us as they're changing the script. So originally, we can't pay for the car windshield. So we go to Gridiron Stadium to the locker room where Daryl steals the jock straps. Of Weird. The players. Then they hit the frat party and he sells the jock straps to the frat guys for money. But they're being chased because Sarah's toy box. Looks just like the container from the plutonium that the mom is. Weird. And the end is uh, John Houston style Annie 
uh, trying to get the plutonium from her on a bridge over the Chicago River. Oh my gosh! So all of that was rewritten. See, that's what I was wondering. Scale down, make it cheaper. Uh, we never set foot in the building. I was gonna say, how do they film that those stunts with her? Thirty-five millimeter plate photography. And then we used Intravision, which is front screen projection. For people that don't know, there's a scene where your sister Sarah is climbing up the side or lowering herself down the side of that diamond building in Chicago. There's also a scene earlier on where we're in their chop shop and we're walking above the uh, I beam. Yeah. And there's judicious use of uh, this process. So, what it is is they have this mylar screen that reflects back into the camera, which is the projector. They use a little 45 degree angle, and the camera from the same axis is the projector. Your skin and your costumes don't absorb the projection of the background plane, so it doesn't reflect back. And it gives you a perfect in camera, clean mat, no mat lines, no green screen, no processing in dailies you see the finished product and it helps you do post-production. Oh, we shot cool. January, February, March. We did two months in Toronto, two weeks in Chicago, and then a week in LA for the effects. And we finished uh, mid-March and um, it came out July 4th weekend. Wow, so they were editing it as yeah, you were shooting it basically. Stand camp. I think it was the same camp. Brothers. No, Father Son. They um, had a flatbed Mariola white club and we're stretching out it's like they're copying and spicing the film is moving along totally crazy that's great now, great soundtrack um there were so many classic i love the blues, blues scene that was with shit. with albert collins that's all chris columbus they had said it it makes chicago. no sense really <laughs> like just out of nowhere you end up with a blues club like said, and in chicago he goes it's gonna be all at night and it's gonna be with the steam and the kinger and the uh, he goes i'm gonna get a bunch of old classic chicago deep cut blues deep cut blues so deep that all the record companies that couldn't get together and they couldn't do a soundtrack. There's a few. 25 miles to go. Oh, um, no kidding. There's about three. Express Radio Your Heart, which was a cover by um, Southside Johnny and the Jews. Yeah, but I never thought of that. I See the Future in Your Eyes was an original they wrote for Adventures of the Babysitter. So it's such a great soundtrack, too. Yeah, but they couldn't get the labels to work together. And then um, Babysitting Blues. Recorded on a Sunday. Howard Collins and the Icebreakers. Um, in some classic, you know, historic recording studio. I wasn't paying attention when I was 17. <laughs> music. And Anthony Rapp was trying. He's like, here's the... Um, here's somebody. Reed Smith. Anthony Rapp introduced me to the Smiths. Like, Thank you. Thank you. And I really, really, <laughs> plus cock. So, um, we then, the very next day, Monday, Tuesday, was at Fitzgerald's, which is outside of Chicago a little bit. It is the bar where Paul Newman gave the Bella Bush good to Tom Cruise and Color Oh, cool. Same bar. Remove the pool table, stick 85 black extras. Yeah. They're like, not a white face in the house. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, we shot that. They had three cameras, film. And big dolly track in the back so the camera could just keep going back and forth. The camera sticks. They did it over and over again for two days. At the end of two days, we had shot 13,000 feet of film. I was going to say. Most cut movies are about 11,000 feet of film. So we shot enough to do the whole picture in two days. Yeah. But oh my gosh. I think Chris quote. He said, A good movie has to have three, three good scenes and no bad ones. And he goes, The L train sequence, the, you know, the gang thingy. Yeah. The babysitting blues and Yeah, the gang thing's really weird too. Like the uh the Brad gets the knife in the foot, you know. It's it's a classic scene. People how there's no real danger in which the babysitting, you know, there's like blank. It's got some bad words. But there's no knives. Oh yeah, there is. There's no guns. Oh yeah, there is. <laughs> the maniac in the bus station. Like nobody gets stabbed. Oh, I, I get stabbed. Poor Brenda gets chased no around with stabbed. by a cane. Oh, there's card thievery. There's okay. It's actually pretty uh, pretty dangerous, I guess. So was D Vincent D'Onofrio known? Because um, I mean, I know he knew did Full Metal no. Jacket, but did anybody no, recognize? It yet. Oh, it hadn't. Okay. They were released a week apart. If you no look at the red, if you look, and as a matter of fact, we were doing a press tour where Adventures of Babysitting, me and Anthony Rapp were on uh, 11 cities in a nine day tour. And we hit Salt Lake, and uh, we have some time 
the movie theater playing Full Metal Jacket. And we go, let's see, because we knew Vincent Edgers worked on it. We yeah. knew we'd done it. And they said, this guy's coming and he's method. We go, excuse me? They go, he's Strasburg or whatever. And he just finished a Kubrick movie that was pretty intense. So and he's why did they gonna, want him for the, for the look? He's I not mean... going to play. He's <laughs> not going to laugh and scratch with you kids. He's going to be a, a pretty intimidating. So um, he didn't, he wouldn't break it. I'm all over him like a rat. What was it like to work with Cuban? Really, does he really do a lot of takes? What did you, where'd you guys film? What, and he's just, stay away from me, kid. Is he in character when he's he not is, filming? He, broke, he just to shut me up, Vincent goes, okay, Keith, I'll tell you. He goes, Stanley Kubrick's not in the room for me. He's in another room all together on the monitor. And the reason he goes, he goes, my top was 80 takes. He was the reason that they go take after take. He was number one. Some of the actors didn't know their fucking lines. Oh. Uh, and we'll keep rehearsing. Filming. Take after take. Are you getting it now? You get wow. it now? Just burning money. and Yeah, stuff. yeah. That's the rule number one is so knowing your lines. not expensive. Kubrick rarely used crews larger than five. Wow. If you look behind the scenes and stuff, you'll see very few people. Kubrick would move his own lights. He'd pre-light the night before with the crew. And that that being it. said, how did he act? I mean, did he take to, what did he think of the set? I mean, did he act any differently as in like, this is a, a jokey set compared to where he was coming from? Or was he just so in character no, you, you didn't, you tried not to bother him no, after I that? Mean, he would turn away and. I mean, he's not in that. much of the movie anyway. So you step I, on your mark again. Yeah, it was one day work for him. You know, he would turn away and, and, and be focused and down and not interact with anybody. And then, all right, we're ready to go again. He'd turn around and. You know, get on his mark and then you know, be ready to go. So he just he was pretty much on inaccessible. Now it was interesting. You had asked something before we started this. Was anything cut out? Yeah. Did so, they apart from the script changes, which we fixed all that before we even started shooting? Um, one sequence that wasn't a script from the whole shoot was when we get to Dawson's garage. Um, and by the way, the little track. We go down into the Lower Wacker Drive and they play the beginning yeah, of the yeah. shelter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been lost in under Lower Wacker Drive many times. <laughs> You'll notice that the track cuts out before Mick Jagger's voice comes in because it would have cost more money to license uh, it. Oh, of course. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so we get to, in the script, we get there and we open and we are creeped out and we walk in and three Dobermans come rushing. <laughs> guard, you know, guard dog. Yeah. And they hit a chain, and it stops right before our fake car. You know, yeah. stop right before it. So we get to the set, we go to rehearse, we get on, and I open the thing, and we walk through, and I go, oh, where's the dog? And Chris Columbus goes, yeah, we're not doing that. He just, they called it, they called it probably, you know, a day or so before. That could said, go wrong. Can't find the dog. It's going to take too much time. We don't need it. It's just, we don't need it. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you have to make that call, especially when you're making that kind of a movie. You get a dog to jerk and look like it stopped. Yeah. Yeah, back then people weren't probably as uh, as uh, animal conscious as they are now. I think people would really be offended oh, in no, some of that they some ways. Remember Milo and Otis? That oh, that's true. That's the early true. 90s. They were already quite conscious of yeah. uh, doing with the animals and everything. So let me ask you, the movie, um, when it came out, was it like pretty much an instant success? No. Well, okay, so... I mean, because it's a cult success, I would say. Everybody knows that movie. It, People I don't expect to like that movie love that movie. They go, oh, I love the soundtrack, everything about that movie. They're quoting it. They're going, every, just go, oh, so cool. You know, or... <laughs> still it, get her. It it's contagious. It talk down to kids. <laughs> it knows that everybody is either a kid or someone who's been known. It doesn't have to talk down to them. Yeah. Um, it kind of does an adult type movie. Yeah. Shot slick in all the backlight. And Rick Wake is a cinematographer. He shot stuff like uh, Red Heat and um, uh, Great Outdoors. And I he love very, it. He loves a nice smoky 48 hours, that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, uh, he's actually legendary. He also passed. Um, they, uh, I think in the 80s at that time, with Panavision and the film and the kind of lights and uh, that it hit the perfect aesthetic. 
So they were ha they were content with it, or okay. So it came out, and on uh, like I mean, is this a movie on the that day it came out? I opened the L.A. Times, and there's the calendar section, and you go, all right. People do a little bit ads. They do half page. They full, full yeah. Page, and I'm like I can't find it. I can't find the ad. I get nervous. It's the same weekend. Inner Space is coming out. I'm like we're gonna Great get movie. trounced by um, <laughs> Joe Dante. We're gonna get. It's fine. It's fine. Which is funny because Chris Columbus and Joe Dante did Gremlins together, and now they have movies opening on the same week. Yeah. So, uh, I open and it's the full middle section, two full page, full color. Wow. Nights in Chicago and all the critic thingies and all the theaters, and I said, oh, oh, they're promoting this. And the and the critics really loved cool. it. And they had done a trailer which. Um, they had a meeting at Disney, and we all kind of sat in this conference room, and they played their trailer for them. And Elizabeth Shue was on a Really? She goes, that's not the movie we made, and that's not the movie we want. Oh, it had nothing thinking. to do with how she came off, and it was she was really yeah, seeing no, it as no, she was what, how people she goes, will interpret the movie. That's not, they're going to think it's one thing. I think it was more focused on the dating and the boyfriend. And the yeah. Thing. Not about, they're going to You're misleading back. them you on the movie. You're going to see... I think in the in the trailer you'll see the tire pop out and all this in the in the one that was so she stood up to Chippy Katzenberg at Disney and goes we that changes this and, changed this and, changed this. and they did it and they played the death out of that trailer and it had the, I think it had an Iggy Pop song in the trailer yeah <laughs> and um in the voice and it opened okay they increased theaters second weekend it made more money. I uh, it ran for weeks and weeks and made um, you know, tr more than triple its budget. I think it was nine million dollar budget made thirty six million or something. Is that it the, wasn't a hundred million dollar? Is that the kind of movie that started getting your agents call saying, "Hey, we we want to see Keith Coogan more. We want to uh, we want to put him in something." Did it help your career in any way? I, uh, it it, it I. Did it help anybody else's in the movie? I don't know. <laughs> no, it definitely. Did, no, it did. Oh, did no, it really? Well, she's great in it. She yeah. She's done Biloxi Blues, which hadn't come out yet. Yeah. Like, you had a movie Biloxi Blues? Wow. So, but then right after was The Shadow and um, Carlito's Way. And fantastic. Yeah. I I love Carlito's Way. Yeah. yeah. Lisa was tired. Uh, by the way, uh, Elizabeth Shoes with an S. Elizabeth Suppin. Yeah. And when we got to the set, she goes, to every cool kids call me Lisa. So, oh, Lisa, oh, awesome. Lisa this, Lisa that, Lisa that. <laughs> um, it, um, it, it, it did well. It, it wasn't a runaway hit, didn't lose money. And then it came out on video, and it, people wore the copy. Yeah. And they broke the tape. And they go to the video store to pretend to look around for half an hour and just wind up renting and fetch the babysitting again. This is what they'll tell me on there. Yeah. Now. It's on video. And Does that get relayed to the studios later? Do they even, do they care about the video sales as opposed to the, do they incorporate that all in as, track it. okay, they okay. numbers for it. They care about it. Um, how much to do a run? How much did we make on the 1.3? Well, I wonder if they were like, like, how much do we make like theatrically? How much do we make at home? Run, you know, a run of the VHS or the, when it turned into DVD, they, somebody had to say, let's print a run of the DVDs. Um, so you, they uh, absolutely make their money very quickly on it. They sell them all the time. The thing now they're in like five dollar bin, no problem. Yeah. It's still, still, in. and you need the hard copy because the movie has some language. It is PG-13. It has no boobies. It has no real violence. Um, but it's got some bad words. Well, it's on Disney Plus right now. And it's rated TV PG. Did they bleep the... Uh... They used a lot of the okay, I was... cuts. And they used dubbed over. And, uh, yeah. And they get rid of all the bad words. I'm, I'm That's the world we're living in. I'm not, I'm not happy. Well, so, I was going to no, ask you though, I mean, what, if, for the art, don't if you think it's okay? Should not watch that. Movie. But see, okay, but see, I told Tommy Chong when I met Tommy Chong, my dad had me watching like Nice Dreams when I was like six years old, and he goes, "Did you know what pot was?" And I said, "No," but I understood everything else was funny. And he goes, "He goes, That's awesome," because I always wondered, you know. 
does it stand alone if you don't know what that is? And he goes, you're telling me that the comedy stood alone. I was like, yeah. So that's why I wondered if it's the same thing for for you. If you think, you know, because some, how are you going to clean up Revenge of the Nerds? Certain movies, it's just like the movie is what it is because yeah. it is what it is. Yeah, they didn't uh, cut out. So we self-edited as we were doing the movie anyway with okay. Anthony um, going, you know, Chris is coming over. Have you seen the blue Playboy? We're at the window and he's trying to get in the house. And, uh, and I go to close the door and he goes, she's got these tremendous, and we have closed the door. <laughs> and so that's where, you know what he said. And I don't think they had that for uh, for Disney. Keith, so thank you so much for oh, letting me pick oh, your brain God, about this. Me. I love that movie, and I know so many people do too. So thank I you for for it. I appreciate the uh, the attempt at a TV series. They did a pilot for a TV series, one episode, and uh, I'm glad the Disney Channel made it. The 100th Disney Channel original movie was Adventures in Babysitting with two babysitters. So I, I love. Uh, you think there'll ever be a remake? There's a re there's a remake of. Let's do it. Well, friends, I hope you enjoyed our time with Keith Coogan. What a great guy, and I'm, uh, I'm glad that he was able to tell us some onset stories. Thank you, Vida or Vita Galinas, for making a contribution to my channel. Thank you, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you next time. Have a great night, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.